Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Prayer is the most important key of the kingdom. Prayer is the most important key of the kingdom. There is no key to the kingdom of heaven. But there are keys of the kingdom of heaven. And the most important one in my humble estimation is prayer. That is verified by Jesus Christ, the King himself. He saw prayer as more important than anything else. We will see that during this next few days as we show you in Scripture why prayer is so important. We'll also talk about fasting as being the most powerful tool in prayer. Prayer is the most important key but fasting is the most powerful tool of prayer. Praying is wonderful, and praying effectively is wonderful. But when you mix prayer with fasting, it's awesome. And we need to see why those two go together and to rekindle our love for prayer. Let me begin to talk, first of all, about the, the priority of prayer, why prayer is so important. You will notice that all religions pray, all of them, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, Confucius, Scientologists, Unitarians, everybody prays. So prayer is a part of a religious mechanism for mankind. Now let me explain something as to why all religions pray. All religions pray because the desire to contact and commune with the supernatural is inherent in the heart of all human spirits. So don't be confused that because a person prays, it means that their prayer is being answered to the right God. The desire and the hunger to pray or to commune with a supernatural being is proof that the human spirit is not from this place. Many times we don't know who we're praying to or don't know why people want to pray. If you study the uncivilized, so-called uncivilized tribes that they keep discovering and you go sometime into the history and you read how they find these tribes that were way in the jungle somewhere, no contact with modern humans, and yet that tribe has a ritual of prayer. Maybe they pray to the moon, or they pray to a mountain, or they pray to an animal, or they pray to a tree. They pray to something. There's this human desire to pray. So because we say that everybody prays doesn't mean everybody is praying correctly and praying to the right or to the true God. There is a scripture I want you to turn to that you probably don't read much, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and there is a simple verse found in Ecclesiastes about why 7 billion people on earth have a desire to contact the supernatural. Even the atheists would get involved in Ouija boards. Even the agnostic would want to practice black magic or white magic. Even those who claim that there is no God would still want to, how, however, even follow what they call horoscopes. In other words, everybody, no matter what they say, don't let them fool you, deep in their hearts, they want help from somewhere that is above the natural. Whether it's a star, you know, on their birthday, 
or whether it's some unknown spirit or spirits even ancestral spirits humans are always wanting to contact the supernatural here's why get your pen and underline this I'm going to show you why Ecclesiastes chapter 3 it says to everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under heaven and it lists all the different seasons of life and then it says verse 10 I have seen the God-given tasks with which the sons of men are to, are to be occupied he has made everything what beautiful in its time also underline this he has put eternity in the hearts of every man except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end he has put eternity in the hearts of every human that statement means that every human being knows somewhere that he came from somewhere that is not here and he has a hunger to reach out to the eternity some use idols some use ancestral spirits some use voodoo some use white magic some use seances some use Ouija boards some use booga booga everyone wants to reach out and so when the Buddhist sits down and burns an incense or a Hindu puts food out in the night and burn candles and build little houses and to feed the spirits and when the, the Muslim reaches toward the east and bows to Mecca and prays seven times a day and when the Jew goes to the wailing wall and, and bows and cries out rocking in power and possession these are all human spirits feeling the need for eternity so prayer is common because prayer is man reaching out to somewhere else for help write this down number two prayer is not an option for us In the kingdom of God we are commanded to pray you cannot say that you follow Jesus Christ as your king and don't pray it's impossible he commands us to pray thirdly prayer is the most common experience of those who say they are believers normally when you give your life over to your so-called God whether it's Buddhism, Hinduism, Shintoism, Scientology, Christianity, whatever, they always tell you you got to pray to this God. And so we have people burning incense, people going to a temple to the Buddha, people going to the Hindu gods, six million of them, and everybody's going through their rituals. They're getting their royal baths, being bathing in, the, bathing in the royal river, all this stuff we go through because everyone is wanting to experience the supernatural. God commands us who believe in Jesus Christ to pray and number four prayer is the most talked about but least practice activity of religious Christians every so-called Christian talks about prayer and hardly none of them do it prayer for most people is like buying a cookbook You got a cookbook in your home but never made a single meal from the recipes. We know that we should pray. But we don't do it. We don't practice it. And the question is why don't we practice prayer? Why isn't prayer an excitement for us? Why is prayer so difficult? Here's another question. Why are prayer meetings the smallest meeting in every church? You go to any church in this country or any other country and you will find on Sunday mornings or if you are a Shabbat worshiper on Saturday mornings the place are filled with people 
But then Monday night prayer meeting, three old ladies who ain't got nothing else to do. And they are praying. But what happened to all the folks who were there Sunday morning? Watching TV, playing games, going out to social events. Question, why? Our prayer meetings, the smallest meeting in every church. How about this? Another question. What did Jesus say the house that we meet in is supposed to be called? Now, we normally say a house of worship. That's what we call it. He didn't call it that. So we run to this building whatever your building is, we run to this building to worship. Christ says, my house shall not be called the house of worship. It's to do something more important. Oh dear. You're looking at me funny. What did he say his house should be called? House of prayer. In his mind, it's the most important activity of humans, especially when they come before God. So if prayer is the most important activity of God's priority on the list, then why isn't the prayer meeting the largest meeting in the church? Answer, because people don't get results. And the human spirit is a very interesting spirit. We don't like to do things that don't benefit us. We love to avoid resistance. When things don't work, we avoid them. So we refuse to keep going to a prayer meeting if we feel that this is not working. Do you remember when you first got born again? You went to prayer meeting seven days a week. They couldn't keep you out of the church. And now, no comment. But why? Because of lack of results. I was the same way. I was brought up in a very religious environment. And they had prayer meetings. I aligned myself with the Brethren Church. And then we went to the Baptist church. Then I went to the Pentecostal church. I went to the Assemblies of God for a while. And, and then I went crazy. I went to the kingdom. And in all those experiences, the prayer meeting was always the smallest meeting. Because people didn't get results. Prayer for most people is like going to a vending machine to buy a soda. And you put your first two quarters in, and you hit it, and nothing comes out. You put two more quarters in it, you hit it, nothing comes out. You put another two quarters, and nothing comes out. And after a while, what do you do? First, you kick the machine. Don't forget that. I ain't going back to no prayer meeting. Bam! That don't work. And then you start talking bad to the machine. You dumb machine, you stupid machine. And then you walk away. And you avoid the machine. That's what prayer has become to most people. We keep prying and prying and prying and, and nothing happens. So we decide to stay away. I hope that after this 21 days, God will give you so many answers that you would want to love prayer every single day. Matter of fact, you will pray like Jesus said, pray without ceasing. Let's talk about the prayer principle then. Make a note. John Wesley said something that was very interesting. He said, it seems as if without God, man can do nothing. But without man, God will do nothing. Write this down. Very important. And he's telling the truth. I don't even think Wesley understood what he was saying. He said, without God, man cannot, and without man, God will not. In other words, it seems as if when God wants something done on earth, he has to use a human vessel. And yet, 
if when a human wants something done on earth, he needs to tap into God. So there is a dependency between God and man. That's the vision of prayer. He also says, what happens on earth depends on you. And this is a truth. Nothing happens on earth without a human getting involved. I know this is difficult for you to understand because we talk about the sovereignty of God and the power of God and God is all of those things. But he also has established some principles by which he works. You call them laws by which God functions. And those laws are intact by God. They, they're kept intact by him. And he uses them to keep order. And one of God's laws are very simple. He will not do anything on earth without the cooperation of a human. So here's the conclusion. Prayer is earthly license for heavenly interference. Prayer is God receiving license from a human to interfere in earth. You'll understand this later on during the sessions that are coming, but it's very important that's why you are here. God needs this prayer time to get things done on earth. Matter of fact, no one is more excited about this consecration than God. God is more excited about this consecration than you are. Because God finally will get you away from that television. He will finally get you away from those friends. God finally is going to get you away from all your activities and your business every night and all the fun and games. God says, wow, I finally got a few people on earth who are going to give me their attention and their license. God's excited. So prayer is not an option for you nor God. Prayer is necessary for you to get things done on earth and for God to do things on earth. And this is why I love to pray. Humans can stop God from working on earth. How? By locking up the license. When you think about a scripture like 2 Chronicles, for example, chapter 7, verse 14, a very common one, but please don't read it fast. Read it with me out loud. First line, go. If, stop. If is enough to rest for the next two weeks. What does if mean? Uh-oh. Answer me. What does if mean in a sentence? Ooh, Lord, I'm in trouble. Thank you. If is a condition. Write it down. If means a condition. God begins this communique about prayer with if. Now he's talking about a country that's in trouble. You'll see it there. And he says the country is in trouble. The nation is in trouble. The community is in trouble. The whole earth is in trouble. And I cannot fix it. I am powerful. I'm omnipotent. I am omniscient. I am almighty. I am the creator. I can do anything. But I can't touch that planet, he says. Why? I'm waiting for a condition. What's the condition? Read. If my people. Now, God says, look, a lot of people praying. A lot of people doing stuff. A Muslim prays seven times a day. They would spread their rug in the middle of a store. But what about you? You sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, baptized, tongue talking, Jesus loving person. Don't answer that question. See, he says, I'm finding a lot of people. But I can't find my people. 
My people implies not everybody I listen to. One point two billion Muslims. God said that's fine. Three hundred million Hindus. That's fine. Eight hundred million Buddhists. That's fine. I still looking for my people. Everybody bowing down to something. Everybody burning incense. Everybody giving food to the gods. But I try to find my people. Don't be impressed when you see two million Muslims in Mecca on that TV bowing down with that black rock in the middle in that little box and look so impressive. God says, I'm still looking for my people. My people means I have a different group of people that I depend on and I want to hear from. Now, God has a little problem with his people. He said, my people got a couple of problems. First, he says, they wicked. I think I better stop right there. He says, and they full of pride. The opposite of humility is pride. I kneeling down in my nice soft stockings. I ain't prostrating myself in my suit. I ain't going to no prayer meeting to make no noise for no two hours. I got things to do. Pride. If my people. In other words, God is begging to find some humans so he can do something. If means I am depending on, I need, I must have some people. You cannot not just take time to pray. You cannot. Heaven is depending on you. Come on, Sibrasite. Pardon me, it's the Holy Spirit you talk. That wasn't your business. If my people should do what? Humble themselves. Now the word humble here is also the word used for striking your chest or tearing your clothes. It's normally a word that is identified with, uh, we call it fasting, but it's more than fasting. It is like beating your chest out of righteous indignation. Humble yourself. That means let the things that make God weep cause you to weep. Humble yourself means to feel what God feels about the, your neighborhood. Humble means to identify with God's burdens. He's carrier. He's looking for a human to dump his answers to the burden through. He needs you to stop long enough to say, Lord, uh, you can use me to solve that problem. Here's my faith. Prayer requires humility. Read the next statement. If my people who are called by what? My name shall humble themselves and pray. Pray and do what? And seek my face. Now, pray is separated from seek my face. Write the term seek my face down. It means consecrate. And that's why we cannot fast and pray and still watch TV. This is why we have to come here every night. You say, well, Pastor Miles, we got to come here for 21 days? Yes, that's consecration. Consecration means you sanctify yourself for a period of time and you don't mix with your normal life anymore. You set your face. 
to seek God. That's why many times you confuse fasting with losing weight. See, you can fast for the purpose of purifying your body and losing weight and get no spiritual benefit because you can be fasting for the personal private purpose for reducing your weight in other words you're missing meals but not seeking God he says I don't want people who just humble themselves and who just pray I want people who will also seek my faith set themselves fast to seek God's face to put aside distractions and other priorities in their lives and to say God this time is set aside just for you that's called consecration so you cannot be on a fast like this and live a normal life if you do that you are simply on a diet Is everybody with me? So when God says, I'm seeking for people, I'm not seeking for somebody who is trying to lose weight. I'm trying to seek someone who is waiting on me. Pursuing me. God says, if I could find those people, a condition. Okay. Now, and then he says, and they must turn from what? Their wicked ways. God is suggesting that most of the people he's trying to use are wicked people. Don't look now. There's one right behind you. Don't look. Keep looking at me. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the person right behind you, okay? He said, the people I'm trying to find are wicked. Now, we think of wickedness, you know, as witchcraft and stuff like that. No. Jesus used the word wicked a couple of times to describe some people and they had nothing to do with the devil. The first one he talked about was when there was a, a man who had three servants. Remember that story? And he gave them some money, talents. One of them took the money and did what? Buried it in the ground and did nothing with it. Jesus used the word wicked. That means this person did not use the gifts God gave them to bring profit to God. I wonder if you're in that category. Wicked. The second place he used the word wicked is when the people start asking for miracles. They want to see signs. They leave Nassau, catch a bus, and drive to Baltimore to watch Benny Hinn work miracles. He called that wicked. Oh dear. He said only a wicked and an adulterous generation seek after signs. I'll only believe in God when I see something happen. God said, what if you don't see anything happen? Do you still believe in me? See, wicked people want to put a condition on God. I'll serve you if you do this, God. God said, there's no bargain in this. You are product, I am manufacturer. You are pot. I am pot maker. You don't deal. You don't bargain with me. Lord, if you get me out of this scrape, I'll serve you. Because you wicked. He's looking for people who don't make deals with him. They just show up and say, God, I am sorry. I humble myself and I consecrate myself and I open myself for you to use me, oh Lord. Use me. God said, I like this man. God ain't looking for dealers. He's looking for vessels. Are you with me? That's why if you're going to go on this fast, 
This is not a game. And if you're going to be serious about this, God's going to watch you. He's going to say, let me see if this just, you try to be religious on me. Whether you truly, genuinely are going to put your face toward heaven and put your heart toward the throne and say, God, I won't let you go until you bless me. That's what Jacob did, man. Jacob, he wrestled. He told God, I ain't going to leave you. I ain't going to let you go until you bless me. God changed his character. That's what name means. I wonder if you're going to have a Jacob experience in the next 21 days. Anybody ready to wrestle with God? I believe that many nights this altar shall be filled with wrestlers who would hold on and say, God, I am not going to let go until I know there's a breakthrough in this area of our nation. This is not casual encounter with God. This is wrestling time with God. Prayer means that you turn from your wicked ways, your ways of lackadaisical, shallow spirit making deals with God. Notice he says, then will I hear where? From heaven. God said, I ain't coming to earth. I'm staying in heaven. Because you're trying to get heaven on earth. Then I will what? Forgive their sin. Notice the word singular. Sin, not sins. The word here is the word rebellion. It's the word used when Adam fell. You rebel against me. One act is called sin. You try to do things your own way. That's sin. You try to run the earth without me. That's sin. You try to abandon me and not have me interfere on earth. God says, you are full of sin, rebellion. He says, I'll forgive your rebellion. Why? Because now you're coming back to me saying, we need help from heaven. And that's why this consecration is so important. Heaven has been waiting for this three weeks all year. Hallelujah. God, Jehovah, Jesus the Son, the Word, the Holy Spirit have been discussing this meeting. And they've been saying, it's getting closer. It's getting closer. I think they're going to do it. I think they're going to do it. I wonder who's going to last. I wonder who's going to commit themselves. I wonder how many we're going to have this time that we can do some work through. Anybody want God to work through them? Lift your hands up and say, Lord, use me. Hallelujah. That's how important you are. You are so important to God that God put a condition on healing earth. He said, if I could just get you to line up with me, I can get some things done. Look at the last part. He says, I will forgive their sin and heal their country. You know, I am sure you, like me, wonder many times when they call national prayer meetings, nothing seemed to improve. Could it be that they're not getting it right. Jesus said these words. They think they will be heard because of their much speaking, you know. These people worship me with their lips, but their hearts, he says, are far from me. Calling meetings doesn't mean God is meeting with the meeting. I will heal the land if I can just get some people. See, God don't want no one day prayer meeting. Read it carefully. Humble yourself, pray, and then what? Consecrate. I need, you know, when you read the Bible, this book is something else. When you read the Bible, whenever there was a national problem, you know who declared the fast? The king. Not the priest. We ain't serious in our countries. And guess what? When they declared the fast, the whole nation stopped. We have
national problems, right? Okay. So a small group of Christian believers have a national prayer meeting in a hotel with 20 people. And every member of parliament is drinking wine or having a little meeting somewhere, you know, having a little, a little club or something, or having a little, little meeting, drinking and having a little thing. In other words, this is God's type confused here. I'm waiting for my people. All of y'all claim to be a Christian nation. He says, y'all say you have my name. I want everybody to stop. And I'll heal the land. What I like about God, though, if God just have enough, he starts working. And I got a feeling, looking at your face tonight, God just might have enough to heal this country and heal your family and heal your community and heal your neighborhood. If you got faith, lift your hands and believe God right now. Lord, use me to bring healing to my land. Prayer. In the name of Jesus. Ephesians 6 verse 7, read, 17, read. Take the helmet of salvation, he says, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, the reason why I put this verse in here is because when you read verse 15, 16, and 17, it talks about the armor of the Lord. Helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, shield of faith, sword of the spirit, loin cord of truth. You got the shoe of peace, all this stuff, right? Now, people, listen to me. I've heard preachers preach on that scripture. God forgive me if I did it too. Please forgive me. When they preach on it as if the church or the believer is a soldier. And we're going to fight the devil. And so we, we get this idea that we're going out and we're going to just beat up the world. We're going to beat up everyone who's evil. We're going to fight people and fight things. But look at the verse. After you dress in all of that, He didn't say go outside the church and beat up people. He said, the reason why I dress you, he said, is because I want you to do the most important activity. What is it? Prayer. That's it. You dress up in heaven of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, shield of faith, sword of the spirit, loin of truth, shoe of peace. You're ready to go and God's going to just stay there and pray. That's it. The most important job is to pray. You want to fight for, for, for the kingdom? Just pray. You want to fight for God? God says, pray. Give me license. Because the battle is not yours. Can I hear just someone say amen or about there at least one person? He said, look, this ain't about you fighting. It's about you giving me permission. He said, the reason why I saved you and made you righteous and gave you faith and the word and give you truth so that I could come through you and get things done in prayer. Amen. Hallelujah. So the first week, we normally in prayer, we deal with you. We check your helmet to make sure you're safe. Because some of y'all might have slid in the wrong way. And then we check the breastplate to make sure that your life is lined up with the word because if you ain't living in righteousness then your words make no sense to God let me get check and make sure your faith is intact that you believe what God says and then we got to make sure you have the word of the sword in your hand that's why we teach every night and we got to make sure you got truth right in the secret places around your loins where all your secrets are to make sure your life is clean privately. Otherwise, you can shut down this prayer meeting. It's amazing, hey, you can look good, helmet shining, breastplate shining, shield shining, short thought shining, and got dirty loins. David always says this, 
Oh God, give me truth in the inward parts. Because see, you can always lie openly. You can look shiny outside. But truth is always around here. Your sex life, your, your lust life, that's where the junk is. He said, I want loins of truth if you're going to start praying. Come and get everything out before God and open. And say, Lord, forgive me. Deliver me from this habit, from this wrong life. Otherwise, you are wasting your time in this fast. After putting on all of that, he says, pray. Isn't that something? That's what you have to do. Your work is pray. Your fight is pray. Because all God needs is for you to give him permission to get things done. Comprende? Matthew 6, 9. Jesus said, look. They asked Jesus a question. They said, teach us to pray. He said, okay, here's how to pray. Our Father who is where? In heaven. Hallowed be thy name. That means your name is different, distinctive. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He said, look, to get things in heaven done on earth, you have to pray for that to happen. They ask him, what should we pray for? He said, you got to pray for heaven to come to earth. Heaven cannot come to earth without you praying for it to happen. The kingdom of God can be locked out of earth by a prayerless church. I expect miracles to begin to happen this week. And the deeper you get into the fast, I expect more multiplicities of miracles to begin to happen in your life and in those in your, your, your family life. Anybody ready for some miracles to happen? Huh? This is a good time for you to bring people who you believe in God for a miracle for to the altar. Matter of fact, in a little moment, we're going to hand out some prayer cards. This is where you got to put the burdens that you're carrying on those cards so we can dose them in fasted prayer and invite God to come in and interfere in those affairs. Amen? Prayer was the only thing that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them. This always intrigues me. I, I can't get over this still. I discovered it at age 15 when I read the Bible. I realized that the only thing they asked him to teach them was teach us how to pray. That is not a Bahamian request. Am I right? It's not a Filipino request. If you live with Jesus and you saw him walking in the water, casting out demons, healing the sick, raising the dead, speaking the trees, you'd say, hey, teach me how to do that. Why? I want to learn to do sensational stuff. Teach me how to walk on water. Teach me how to talk to a tree. Teach me how to speak to fish. Teach me how to cleanse leprosy. Teach me how to open blinded eyes. Teach. They saw all of that and never asked them how to do it. The only thing they asked them is in Luke 11, verse 1. One day it says, Jesus was praying in a certain place. What was he doing? Praying. This is very interesting, eh? God is praying to God. Why? Because God is in a human body. Amen. And to get things done on earth through humans, the human got to give the Father permission. So here he was in a certain place praying. I like this part. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, let's pause there for a minute. I want you to picture that for a minute. He's in the bush praying and all them peeping. They were not praying with him. They were watching this happen. It says, and when he was finished. That means they waited until he was finished. Now, why would they be following him to the bush and then stop a little distance off and watch him do this thing? And they saw him do it every day. As a matter of fact, the Bible says 
Jesus arose a great while before day and went to a solitary place to pray as was his custom. Ooh, don't you get it? A great while before day. Day in Israel, even today, begins at 4 a.m. That's when the merchants go to the market. That's when the shepherds take their goats to the market for exchange and sale. They rise early to get to the market in time. A great while before day. So calculate what time he got up. Markets open around 7 o'clock. Great while is 4 a.m. He got up a great while before. Which means that Jesus would get up around 2 a.m. in the morning and start praying. And he prayed until the day started at 7. How many hours that is? Three, four, five, six. Average of five hours. They would miss him in the night. Where did he go? He's gone to do this thing every morning. He's gone. He's go every morning. He's gone. He's gone. So they started following him. What's he doing all day every morning? And they kept wondering. And they began to notice he's doing this thing. Seven hours. Five hours. And then, when the day began, he would heal a blind man in two seconds. And they began to figure something out. He did that for five hours and healed him in five seconds. Hmm. So that is more important than that. And that makes that possible. So if we want to do that, then we got to learn how to do that. That was their conclusion. So they developed what I call inductive deductive logic. They deduced that if he does that for five hours and then heals a lame man in five seconds, then healing a lame man is related to what he does for five hours. Which means, in their conclusion, it was simple. Their, their conclusion was, if you spend more time doing that, you'll spend less time doing that. You mean, you are going to go on a prayer and fasting consecration for 21 days? Are you all crazy down there? Y'all falling down Miles Monroe? He can make y'all fast and pray for 21 days. I ain't making y'all do nothing now, okay? All right. But they'll say that. They'll say, you know, what, what are you doing? You don't just, you know, pray in the morning 10 seconds, brother. You know, pray a little prayer and then go to your work. God himself in the flesh prayed average of five hours every morning. Who do you think you are? Their conclusion is, more time with God, less time with man. Can I say it again? The more time you spend with God, the less time you spend with man's problems. So when you got a problem, go lock yourself up. Sometimes we go to the problem, we work on the problem for hours, we work on the problem for hours, on the problem, hours. God said, look, leave the problem and just shut up with me. Instead of spending five hours trying to fix that, spend five hours with me and let me fix that. Lord Jesus. Can I hear an amen? amen? Some of you got some relatives who are sick. And God is saying, let's use this fast for them. Okay? I don't want you to worry about them. Just focus on me. And make me obligated to come in. And impact the situation. Miracles shall happen here. I can smell them. Miracles shall happen here. The scent of miracles are in the air. You haven't smelled them yet. I can smell them. There's going to be powerful miracles because God finally got a few people who are going to consecrate themselves. Now, I'm going to tell you now, the devil hates this. He's going to fight you with chocolate cakes, beef and rice, and chicken, 
steam down with onions. In the name of Jesus, praise the Lord. Help me out here. Barbecue ribs dripping with sauce. He gonna mess with your mind. Why? He gotta break the consecration. He's afraid. The devil is as afraid as God is happy. Let's make God happy. Give him a hand. Let's make him happy. Lord, teach us to pray. What did they say? Teach us to pray. Don't teach us nothing else. Teach us to do this thing that you keep doing. Because we have deduced from observing you that if you do this thing a lot, you'll do this thing little. Jesus cast out a demon with the finger of God, the Bible says. Poof. Demon gone out. Just with a word. Out. Why? Because the morning of that day, he spent five hours with the Father. What do we do? We do the reverse. We spend 15 minutes with God in the morning and then try to cast a demon out in five hours. Come out, I bind you. Loose, come out. Mm, oh Lord, come out. Ah, come out. You ain't coming out, you better come out. You take over, you take over, I'm tired, okay. Come out. Yes, sir. come out. Loose, come loose, bind. Loose, loose him. Bind, I bind you. Loose. The devil said, look, I'm confused. Loose or bind? <laughs> we spent hours trying to cast a demon out and spend no time with God in prayer. You remember the disciples did that, eh? Disciples prayed for a demon to come out. The demon laughed, remember? The demon said, I ain't coming out. And then I asked Jesus Christ, they said, why couldn't we cast him out? What's Jesus' answer? He didn't say his prayer wasn't enough, he says. This kind, you can't just cast out demons with prayer. And there are some situations, I guarantee you, in your life right now that are spiritual problems. He say, I'm praying, I'm praying. God said, look, you don't understand. This problem is a spiritual problem. It has a physical manifestation, but it's a spirit behind it. And you can get rid of it by just praying. I smell miracles. Come on, let's believe God. I smell. God is going to do some things you've been trying to get done for the last 12 months. He's going to do it in 12 minutes because of prayer and fasting. Spirits don't listen to you because you pray. They listen because you paid the price to pray. Fasting. All right. Uh, let, me, let me go to something because we're going to pick up here tomorrow night. But I want to just close on, on this subject of, of fasting. And don't miss tomorrow. You gonna miss tomorrow? You miss tomorrow, you gonna miss God. Can I hear an amen? amen. I want to just show you why I fast. See, when I was when I was 18 years old, I read a book by a man named Franklin. My mother had this book in the in the house. The book was on prayer. And this guy was a was a miracle working guy. He cast out demons, had big tent meetings, and he said. He said the secret to his work was fasting. And in his book, he talked about how important fast was. I was 18 years old. And I said, God, I want your power. You know, all these folks, some of these Baptist people, these Anglican people, I said, I want power. I, I don't want to just go through this ritual stuff. I want power. God says, pay the price. 18 years old. In the back of his book, he had a list of what to do to fast. And I tell my mom, I go on a fast. She said, you're not going to eat? I said, I'm not going to eat. I'm going to fast. I'm going to fast until I receive God's power. And I fasted for 11 days, 18 years old. And I used to suffer from hay fever. And I got healed from hay fever even to this day. Never had hay fever like that. I had asthmatic condition. It would come and go. Never had it since. God said, I'll show you my power. 
And we found a group called the Visionaries. And we had a meeting in a little church in Baintown. The singers, we were singing. And a young boy with a demon was sitting in the room. And that demon started acting up in that chair, kicking it over, breaking the whole meeting. And something came over me. I'm a teenager, you know. And I got up and I said, Devil! And the whole church went quiet. Come out of here! And the little boy ran up off the ground in the midair, spin over, bam, hit the ground. And I walked over to him. I said, come out and stay out. I didn't know what I was doing. And the demon said, if I come out, I'm coming in you. And I heard myself say, I dare you in the name of Jesus. And the demon left instantly. Pow. Everybody else scattered. The other members of the group was hiding behind the pulpit. Why? When he come out, he ain't coming in me. Because I had fasted, there was an authority inside my gut. That same power is coming to you this week in Jesus' name. When you are fasted in prayer, your boldness goes up a thousand times because you, de have, you develop an authority that is not yours. Listen, look at Matthew 4. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, then he was hungry. Ladies and gentlemen, look at me, sit up straight. I got a little surprise for you. Read the verse again out loud. Read. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The human body is designed to go without solid food for 40 days. I repeat, listen carefully on television. The human body is designed scientifically to do without food for 40 days. You don't hunger until the 41st day. So what you call hunger is habit. 21 days is half of 40. No one in scripture fasted more than 40 days. Moses, 40. Ezekiel, 40. Daniel, 40. Jesus, 40. Why? Because the body can live without food for 40 days. The 41st day, the body begins to consume itself. That's why it's called hunger. The body begins to eat its own muscles. We call that starvation. So if you begin to feel a little pain tomorrow at 12, that ain't hunger. That's habit for the grease. If you feel a little pain three days from now, you feel the devil coming down on you and the all hell breaking loose, that ain't no hunger. <laughs> That's the lust of your flesh talking to the taste buds of your tongue, telling your mind you need a piece of chicken. You don't. As a matter of fact, those who will go for 21 will learn that you got to force yourself to break a fast when you pass 10 days because your body is no longer in charge. You're going to make it, huh? You're going to make it, you know. So don't tell me you, you, you had to break it. <laughs> Pastor Miles, them nuts. Susan. Listen. You know, they ain't took me for lunch. They, if they take you for lunch, tell them, I just want a cup of tea. I don't need to eat. I'm enjoying your company. <laughs> Tomorrow I got a meeting in the morning. I got to drink tea. Right, I'm going to fast. Go to a restaurant with buffet. I want tea. Why? I'm in control of my body. My body is dirt. concentrated and consecrated so until you hit 40 days 
Don't tell me you can die. That's my point. Yeah? When you fast, Jesus said, what's the first word? When, not if. You will do this, he said. When you fast, do not look sober as the hypocrites. Hypocrite means actors. Acting, oh, you know, we're going to fast at church, you know, we're going to fast, boy. Yeah, but we fasted for 21 days. Oh, shut up. Matter of fact, he says, don't disfigure your face like they do and show men that you are fasting. Don't even talk about it. Why? This is supernatural business. This ain't none of their business. I'm not eating today. That's all. Don't get all supernatural on them saying, you know, but the Lord thy God told us that we shall fast it, you know, and the, I'm a spiritual woman of God, you know, and I want you to know that God is going to break in on us. Hallelujah. Shut up. Just tell them, I'm not eating today. They ain't supposed to even know, he says. That's how you fast. Look at the next verse. It says, so that it will not be obvious to men that you are what? Fasting. Christ is saying you will fast. And here's how to fast. Only to your Father in heaven, who is unseen, will see you fasting. And he'll see what you do in secret. And he will what? Reward you openly. Lift your hands. Thank God you can get a reward because you fast. Eh? Hallelujah. This ain't a matter of just calisthenics. You're going to get results, God says. I guarantee you rewards. Glory, hallelujah. I am believing God that before the fast is over, there'll be a few people standing here testifying, saying, my mortgage was paid off by somebody I didn't know. Why? Rewards, he says, will come. I want to hear people testify and say, they went to look and the cancer was gone last week. They couldn't figure out why. And you tell them, I know why. It's a reward from my consecration. You don't just fast for fasting's sake. He says, there will be rewards. Expect them. Second Chronicles says, verse 20, verse 3, three rather, alarmed, Jehoshaphat was the king, Je Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord and he proclaimed a fast for what? The whole country. He said, look, this nation is falling apart and our policies ain't working. Our government legislation ain't solving this problem, he says. I got to tap into something more powerful, he says. And he passed an edict in the country Everybody stop eating, he says. Wow. I wonder what would happen to crime if the House of Assembly goes on a five-day fast. <coughs> if I ever become Prime Minister of the Bahamas, mm -hmm. <sighs> my first act would be to declare a national day of fasting and prayer because there are some problems that are spiritual and we're trying to reason them out with our intellect Joseph had is a king he's a politician he said look we need to declare a fast in the country because we can't solve the problems after that fast they begin to win every war they fought yeah fasting is the willful abstaining from natural pleasures for a spiritual purpose. What is fasting? The willful abstaining from natural pleasures for spiritual purpose. If someone asks you, what are you fasting for? Tell them, I am abstaining from natural pleasures for a spiritual purpose. Natural pleasures like cheesecake on my taste buds. Mm -mm -mm. Some dirty chicken dipped in grease with some ketchup on it. That's a pleasure for some of you. Scotch conk with lemon juice running all over it. That's a pleasure for some people. 
sheep tongues. Oh. Am I messing you all up over there a little bit? Eh? <laughs> Pleasures. Sex with your spouse. Pleasure. Watching your favorite lifetime movie. That's a pleasure. Fasting is you abstain from that. Drinking Coke. It's a pleasure. That's fasting. As a matter of fact, fasting is a personal commitment to renounce the natural in order to invoke the spiritual. You're telling your stomach and your body, you are no longer my priority. I am seeking God. And God is a spirit. And they that commune with him must do it in what? Spirit, not in pizza. <laughs> Fasting is the dedication to a period of time to devote yourself to spiritual priority of prayer without food. That's fasting. We got some folks who have some interesting fasts. I smile with them. They say, we're on a fast, you know. I say, yeah, our church on a fast, right? We're missing breakfast. I do that every day. That's not a fast. We are fasting until 6 o'clock every day. And then we eat. That's not a fast. You're just building up hunger for 6 o'clock. You understand me? People got all kinds of ways to get around it. You know, they, they, they don't want to pay the price. He fasted 40 days without food, it says, and then he was hungry. Putting away the pleasure, man. Boy, listen, eating is a pleasure now. Let's be honest. Ooh, Lord, some of y'all can't wait to pass the mass hurry up. Because you know, I got to hit something before 12 o'clock. <laughs> I know. Look at them over there. Look at that. Them spirits over there. I mean, some of y'all can <laughs> Yeah, I see your sister Sybil in the back there. Yeah, we're working on that, that pot on the stove still, huh? Finish that off before 12. I'm going to keep you all right here till 12.05. <laughs> Let's not be One last pleasure, Pastor Miles. Just one last pleasure. <laughs> Lord, some of y'all praying. Look at that. <laughs> Father, forgive them. They know, they just what, they know just what they're doing. <laughs> All right. Uh, fasting is not just missing a meal. Fasting is not dieting. Fasting demands replacing the reading of the word and prayer with your meals. In other words, when you were going to eat, you eat spiritual food. Fasting requires spending more time in the word. And you'll be amazed how much time you will have on a fast. As a matter of fact, I guarantee you that for the next three weeks, you're going to get twice as much done in a day than you did in the last three months. Guaranteed, every time. Because fasting gives you back your time. You'll be amazed how much time you spend eating every day. And you get that time back. Read Isaiah 58. Read it. Why have we fasted, they said, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fast, God says, you do as you please. Stop reading. He said, look, you guys still watching TV. You're still hanging out. You're still doing stuff. He said, look, you, say, you ask me why I don't hear your fast? He said, because it's like nothing changed. You can't do what you feel like doing on a fast, he says. You can't do what what? What you please. Everybody say please. Everybody say please you. He says, a fast is not just missing meals. And then watching TV for five hours. 
because you ain't eaten. That's not a fast. You must focus on God, pursue God, hunger for God, read his word, study, meditate, spend time before God. That's fasting. Fasting is getting quiet when there's noise around. Fasting is getting into the closet of life when the whole world is a racket. Fasting is consuming yourself with the passion of God at the expense even of friends. You might want to call some friends tomorrow and say, look, uh, I'm going to be missing certain events in the next three weeks. I'm not participating in certain things. I am focusing on some important things that I need to get done in my life. Let people know that you're not available for certain things that may be distracting to your spirit. He said, you exploit workers. You, 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 you confuse yourself. Look at the last part. He says, you cannot fast the way you do today, he says, and expect your voice to be heard. That's in the Bible. Are you ready to go on this fast? Are you ready for 21 days? 14 days? 7 days? Are you ready to go? I believe you're ready. Yeah? Benefits of fasting. I want to close with this because I want you to go home a little motivated today. These are the benefits of fasting. You want to write them down. Number one, spiritual discipline. When you fast, your spirit begins to take over your body. And for the first time for some of you, it's going to be such a joy. You won't believe how good you feel. Your body will no longer run your life. Right now, you are in control by your body. Your body controls you. Fasting takes the spirit and put it in charge of the flesh. Number two, increase spiritual capacity. When you fast, you have less flesh and more spiritual capacity. So more of God's spiritual access is available to God. Thirdly, fasting gives you clear, sober thinking. Your intellect is going to be quadrupled by 14 days. You, your thinking will, will be explosive. You're going to think so clearly, you're going to think that you got a new mind. Because your body will no longer be interfered with your thought life. Fasting gives you a pure heart, a pure mind. You decide to see things in a pure way. No more lust will be battling in your mind. Your mind will see things purely because your spirit is in charge. Fasting gives you a hunger for God. You have a desire to read God's word. The more you fast, the longer you fast, the more you want to be with God. You'll see it happen. Fasting also gives you physical health. All the free radicals and the... And the the stuff that came from all of that food you ate that's in your joints that's causing all the pain and aches and swellings and, and arthritis and this arthritis and that arthritis, all of them will start coming out of your body through your urine. My health today is because of fasting. The Bible talks about the fast that purifies your body. There are people here with testimonies who've been on a long fast with us who got healed from things that they couldn't get healed from with medication. Fasting is one of the purest form of health. We don't practice it enough. Number seven, everybody say praise the Lord. Say it again, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Fasting also benefits you by losing excess weight in your body, which puts more burden on your heart to pump blood, which causes you to have hypertension, which causes you to develop sugar diabetes. Fasting can cleanse that stuff out of your body. We don't fast. Fasting purifies your body. Spiritual freedom. Matter of fact, your clarity spiritual will be so exciting that you will want to be with God all day. Free in the spirit. It also brings you physical freedom. You feel lighter. You feel healthier. Matter of fact, you'll find yourself working longer with more energy because your body will have pure energy. After 10 days, something happens to your body. On the 14th day, there's a miracle. Your energy quadruples. Could you imagine? Lack of food and fasting gives you energy. That's why you're tired right now. Too much food. Your body is struggling, trying to digest yesterday's meal. It hasn't started on today's meal yet. 
You have tried that while you're sleeping. That's why you're tired when you wake up. Your body never slept. That's why you can't get out of bed in the mornings. Your body wasn't sleeping. Too much junk. Fasting purifies all of that. Fasting also causes the Bible says your light to shine. Light means the knowledge of God in your life will explode. You get revelation. It protects you. By God watching over you. We're going to read that in Isaiah tomorrow. God says when you fast, he himself watches over you. You get divine protection. Why? Because God needs you to work through you. So he protects you. Hallelujah. When you consecrate yourself, God protects you. Because God finally got you now. He got someone he can work through. Number 14, answers to prayer. Starts happening fast. Intimacy with God. Increased retention capacity. The capacity to read and remember goes up when you fast. And the longer you fast, the sharper your memory is. That's why I get most of my revelations during a fast. I get most of my reading of the word of God that stays in my mind during a fast. Because there's no clutter for the memory to work with. When you read a page, it goes directly into your spirit and it stays in your memory from fasting. Finally, fasting increases spiritual sensitivity. You become a discerning spirit. You can pick up spirits far away. Because your spirit becomes so sensitive that if a demonic thing came into the room, you can actually discern it. You'll know it's there. Fasting is the greatest solution to man's problems. Prayer and fasting, key to our power. Welcome to a journey we're going to take together. Welcome to the greatest life you will ever live. The life where the body is no longer the leader, where you, the spirit, takes over. Welcome to the period of time when God will finally, not just you draw near to him, but he will draw near to you. Welcome to the biggest fight with the devil you ever had for a long time. Don't forget him, okay? Because he is so afraid that you are about to become energized with power that he cannot resist. He will force you to eat that piece of chocolate on your desk. Take it off. Give it away. Before a fast, I would tell my wife, before a fast, we started from one week ago, we started getting rid of stuff in the house. We give everything away. Christmas time, you know, everybody got them cakes, we start giving cakes away. We bless you. I bless you with a cake, brother. God bless you. Bless you with a pie. Bless you. Then get it out of the house. Why? We don't want no temptation in the house. I know some of y'all ain't gonna do that, but try it, please. In the name of Jesus. Go home and eat all of it tonight. <laughs> oh Lord, you cannot eat that cake. Don't try to eat all that cake. Take it to work tomorrow. Bless some people. Praise the Lord. Push away the plate and receive spiritual substance from God. Amen. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.